Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last episode, we created a basic texture viewer in order to inspect imported textures. In this new episode, I'd like to spend some time and enhance the user experience and make the texture editor more useful with the addition of a couple of new features. At this point we have everything we need in order to import an image and create a 2D texture from it as you can see here. We can also inspect the imported texture. All we have to do now is to upload it to the low level renderer and use it as a shader resource for texturing. Before doing that however, I'd like to add some quality of life features to this editor which makes it more user friendly. The first feature that we'll add is the ability to use the keyboard to zoom, center and fit the image to the size of the texture editor's window. The first step is to write a few simple methods which do the things that I just mentioned. The simplest method is the one for displaying the image using its actual size in pixels. It centers the image and sets the scale factor to 1 which will display the image at 100% of its size. The center method computes the pan offset such that the center of the image coincides with the center of the texture view control. Zoom in simply increases the scale factor by about 10% and zooms into the center of the image. Zoom out is the same except it decreases the scale factor by 10%. Zoom fit calculates the scale factor for which the image will exactly fit the size of the texture view. Previously I made this control focusable. But this isn't the right place to do that since the texture view is embedded in texture editor view. So I'm going to remove these from here and put them in texture editor view control. Now we can use command bindings with keyboard keys. We have already done something similar long ago when we made the world editor. However, this time instead of using these predefined commands, we are going to define our own set of routed commands. In order to do this, we create a new static class and call it texture view commands. In here, we add one field for each command. So we have to define center, zoom in, zoom out, zoom fit and actual size commands. Then we can decide which key or key combination will cause the command to execute. You can choose whatever you see fit for this. I'll use the home key for center, control plus and control minus for zooming in and zooming out. 
Alt-0 for zoom fit and Ctrl-0 for actual size command. Now all we have to do is to tell WPF which method should be called when a command is executed and press F12 again in order to generate each method. Each of these will then call the corresponding public method in the texture view. Of course, this only works if the texture editor has keyboard focus. Therefore, we call focus in its constructor. In texture view, I'd like to center the image whenever the view size changes. I'll also zoom to fit when the image size changes. This happens, for example, when you select a different MIP level. Here we can see that the image is centered and fit in the window as soon as it's loaded. We can zoom in and out using Ctrl plus and Ctrl minus key combinations. Ctrl zero displays the image in its actual size and Alt zero does the zoom fit. If I pan away from the image and press the home key, it will recenter the image. And finally, selecting a different MIP level will center the image and fit its size to the size of the window. Now it would also be nice to be able to see what the current zoom level of the image is. For this we can add a label that displays the scale factor in percent. Maybe let's get a bit fancy and use a nice semi-transparent background border with rounded corners and within this border we display the scale factor. This is all we need to do to display the zoom level, but I'd also like to hide this label and show it only when the user changes the scale factor. One subtle interaction that I'd like to use is that we change the scale factor using the mouse wheel only if the zoom label is not hidden. If it is hidden, we'll show the label and ignore the first mouse wheel tick. This enables the user to check what the zoom level is without changing the zoom. The zoom label is also shown when the zoom function is called. Set zoom label will start an animation that fades in the zoom label, making it visible and fades it out after the fade in animation is completed.
And there you have it. It works whenever we use the mouse wheel or the keyboard to change the zoom level. It also works when the image size is changed when selecting a MIP level. It's a small thing, but it does add a lot to the user experience, in my opinion. The next topic is selecting RGB and alpha channels or a combination of those. This is useful when we are working with a texture that's a combination of multiple textures. For example, since the roughness of a material can be expressed in a single value, we can use the red channel of a texture to hold the roughness. The same holds for ambient occlusion and any other material parameter that can be given by a single value. This way we can combine up to four different grayscale images in a single texture. Having the ability to select a channel will enable the user to inspect each texture individually. Therefore, I'm going to add buttons to view all channels. Only red, green, blue, or the alpha channel are a combination of channels. I'm going to use a toggle button because each channel can be toggled on or off. For example, the red channel's toggle button has a red rectangle. I'm also going to add a style for toggle buttons so that they'll look the same as regular buttons in Primal Editor. Instead of creating an entire new style just for the toggle button, we can reuse the button style. We can set its target type to button base and use it for any kind of button that's available to us. Well, that didn't work because I forgot to change the target type of the control template to button base as well. Ah, okay, so some of these properties are specific to each button type. That means that we need to specify the button type that has this property in order to be able to use it in the trigger. For example, we want to use is defaulted property for regular buttons. Toggle buttons have an additional is checked property for which we want to have a trigger as well. We want the button to have a blue background when it's toggled on. Now it looks like other buttons and becomes blue when it's checked. Awesome, we can add the buttons for green, blue and alpha channels next. In addition to these, I'll add another toggle button that we can use to display BC5 textures as either a regular two-channel texture or a normal map. Most often this format is used to save the X and Y components of a normal map in the texture. The Z component is calculated in shader. However, it's also possible that the BC5 texture contains other information. In that case, we don't have to calculate the blue channel. This button is only visible when the texture format is BC5. In order to use these buttons, I'm going to define three new commands in the texture editor's view model.
we can bind set all channels command to the button that will toggle on all channels. The RGBA toggle buttons will execute the same command but with a different command parameter. This is simply a number, but any set of characters can be used as long as they are all different for each button. The normal map button executes regenerate bitmaps command with a boolean command parameter. This way the image bitmap is regenerated differently depending on whether we want to see it as a normal map or not. This button is checked by default if the texture was imported as a normal map. In Texture Editor's constructor, we can define which method should be called for each command. Before writing these methods, I'm going to add a boolean property for each of the channels. Each property indicates whether the channel is selected or not. When we want to toggle all channels, we just set all backing fields to true and fire a notify property changed event for each one of them. The reason that we are setting the backing fields instead of the properties will become clear in the next video. When we set individual channels, we first toggle all channels off. However, we only do this if the user is not holding down the shift key. That's how we can select a combination of channels. Recall that we have different command parameters for each button. Here we can use that information to toggle the button that was clicked. So if it was toggled on, it will turn off and vice versa. And finally we have regenerate bitmaps command, which should take a boolean parameter, so let me correct that mistake. It just calls generate slice bitmaps method with a boolean command parameter and raises a property changed event for selected slice bitmap. This will update the displayed image in the texture view control. Now we can click these buttons, but I forgot to bind them to the channel properties. Fortunately, I can do that while the application is running. Note that the binding mode is one way. This is because the button state is updated by the value of these properties, but the value of the properties is updated through the command binding. Now you can see that I can select one or more buttons and I can also turn on all of them by pressing the all button.
Obviously, they're not doing anything right now. For this, we need to write a shader effect that will render our image using the selected channels. This is an interesting WPF exercise, which we are going to do in next week's video. Thank you as always for joining me and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.